All right, next up is the lady from the 57th. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'm rising today not because anything I say is really going to change today's outcome. Um, my vote in this budget as a Democrat in the minority is not going to change passage. Um, but I was elected by the people of the 57th to be their voice and to bring their voice into this chamber. And it's quite an honor to do so, and I'll use this voice today for them. Um, I was pleased to hear the rep from the 53rd and my seatmate here from the 17th refer to uh, Charles Dickens. Um, I was an English major, and I was about to tell you that if this budget process was a novel, it would be called A Tale of Two Budgets. The subtitle might be Cuts Versus Kids, How a Once-in-a-Generation Visionary Path Was Decimated by Short-Sighted Majority. But then I thought maybe I should talk about it as a historical novel. I'm from Appleton, the birthplace of Harry Houdini. Um, it's more like a, a, a budget not, not based in reality, an escape from reality, you might even say. Because um, truly, if the claim is that this budget funds schools, I know that the authors are not centered in reality because, Mr. Speaker, if you have spoken to any K-12 through teacher or administrator in your district, you would know that property tax relief does not pay for staff or for the direct needs of students in the classroom. Instead, this budget creates the illusion of supporting schools when in reality it is worse than any budget we've seen before. I wanna give you some insight from two school districts in my district, permission to read from a printed document from time to time. Without objection. The Appleton Area School District told me, quote, we have $4 million in operational increases every year due to increases in transportation, cleaning and maintenance, health insurance, other insurances, tech contracts, and usually a 2% increase to staff compensation. With no increase from the state, we will be forced to take these dollars from other areas in our budget. Given that our only non-operational expenses are staffing, this is where we will look to cut. We will see larger class sizes, less options for classes at our secondary level, and less support for our struggling students. Because of the compounding effect of our operational increases, we will see an $8 million increase in the second year of the biennium over our current year. I don't even want to think about what these cuts are going to have to be, we're going to have to make in 2022-2023. Again, we have to cover our operational expenses, which means we will cut staffing, and that directly affects students. Directly affects students. In Menasha, I was pleased to hear the minority leader reference Menasha in his speech earlier. We have some experience sitting together as the only two Democrats in the CISA six meetings. In the Menasha School District, there is a 62% poverty rate. 62%. This budget provides no money to increase staffing based on the many needs of students, especially those requiring special education support and ELL. This community of Menasha cannot support a referendum with 62% poverty, and schools should not have to go to referendum to support their needs. The state should fully fund these schools sufficiently as the governor's budget did. So these negative, negative impacts on reduction staff, including more students with less support, and as we're emerging from a deadly pandemic, I cannot figure out how the last thing we should be doing is putting schools in a position where they must pack classrooms with more students due to fewer teachers, when kids, as we know, aren't fully vaccinated yet, and there is a new and extremely contagious variant in our midst. We are truly at an unprecedented time in Wisconsin's history as we slowly emerge from this pandemic, and the Biden administration has made historic investments in our schools and distributed funding based on these student needs. The governor's budget furthered these investments and for ongoing needs, and these investments not only can provide necessary resources, but would have a significant positive impact on our economic and social future of our state. We had the money to do this and to cut property taxes. Look, I love a good property tax cut, but why can't we do both? We could do both. There did not have to be either or, and this isn't really about money, Mr. Speaker. This is really about trying to stick it to Governor Evers as we head into an election cycle. The state of Wisconsin had the money to cover the governor's budget and then some. And Mr. Speaker, you took it all away. You lit the match. We are setting fire to a generation of learners. These children who struggled so mightily this last year with, and their heroic educators who spent the pandemic busting their butts to effectively utilize technology, navigate virus mitigation in the classroom, and support these students. This is who is paying the price for this revenge budget. 
The people's budget held so much promise and opportunity, and we were in a remarkable, remarkable position to do it, to have it all, these tax cuts and these well-funded schools and many of the other things you heard my colleagues talk about today that are missing. Instead, we are underfunding schools to the point, frankly, of hostility. We are taking on more debt as a state than we need to, and we are missing many, many opportunities to make Wisconsin healthier, happier, safer, and stronger. We can do better. We did do better. And sadly, that is not what this budget is about. Thank you. Lady from the 21st. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So 